Good evening, everyone. I'll call the uh, one on Tuesday. I was going to say Monday, uh, Tuesday, September 3rd, 2019, Board of Commissioners meeting to order. Uh, this, this evening for the invocation and pledge, I will turn it over to Mr. Beaumont to handle that for us. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, gathering this evening, Lord, and the, uh, the ability and the opportunity to come together as part of the county's government. Father, give us wisdom as we hear and as we debate the cases before us, Lord. But uh, give us clear understanding of what's best for our community. In addition to that, Lord, we sit here with an upcoming, oncoming hurricane. And Lord, I ask that you would give everybody the wisdom to get out of its path. Father, those that, that choose to ignore the warnings and stay, Father, we ask that you would protect them. But first and foremost, Lord, I ask that you would protect all of the first responders. For their job is to stay here and protect the community as best they can, Father. They are diligent in what they do. I pray that you would protect them and keep them safe. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mr. Beaumont. All right, uh, do we have any changes for the agenda tonight? What's on the floor for a motion for approval? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, next item on the agenda this evening is public comment. Um, huge audience. Hopefully people are watching out there. Um, you'll notice we're white. One commissioner tonight, Commissioner... Uh, Owen oh, Etheridge is out um, working the fields, trying to get the corn up before the hurricane. So, uh, wish him well in his endeavors. Um, I was going to say something about the new monitors to all the people in the crowd, but you guys already know about that. So, uh, <laughs> thank you to the staff for getting those put up. Um, we'll be able to see stuff a lot better. Um, as most of you know, uh, uh, we have an 8 a.m. evacuation for residents and our visitors alike starting tomorrow morning. It's Wednesday. Um, DARE will be closing the bridge at some point um, in the near future, and it depends on what, what the wind strength is. So uh, pay attention to that when there's tropical, tropical storm force winds uh, get to that point. That is when they are supposed to close the bridge. So um, if you're coming back after the storm, or during the next day or two uh, as we are doing that, just uh, make sure you have your ID with you. If you don't have a reentry permit, um, a driver's license, uh, tax uh, form, or any kind of power utility bill should do the job to prove that you, as long as your name is on it, to prove that you are an owner slash resident uh, in Currituck County and allow you to get through to access, um, except when they close the road down or bridge down due to those uh, high winds. Um, after the storm, we will make an announcement as soon as we, we know uh, when they open the bridge back up. So please stay tuned to our, uh, our website, and uh, we'll have that, as much up-to-date information as we can for you out there. Um, and uh, lastly, or a couple other things, um, I know in Corolla, we're used to, and in Kirtuck County in general, we're used to dealing with hurricanes. We seem to get them quite often, and over the last 20 years or so that I've been here, they seem to come more and more frequently. Um, but I would urge people not to get complacent. As Commissioner Beaumont said during his uh, prayer, um, you know, think about getting out, think about your life, uh, your health, your safety, or your family, um, and don't become complacent. Uh, we can get used to this stuff, and it can catch you off guard. And uh, so. I would just ask that you uh, think about that. If you don't need to be here, take a little vacation and get away. Um, while you're doing that, please take a minute to clean up your yards. For those of you that are uh, in these high wind areas, anything out there can become a projectile. And uh, so it's a good time to uh, do a little cleanup around the house, the yard. Make sure your hot tub covers are strapped down. There's nothing like a 50-pound uh, hot tub cover moving through the air to uh, do some damage. And uh, I've seen it happen, so uh, please take a moment to to take care of stuff at your pool deck as well. Um, the current pr prediction um, is gusts well over 60 miles an hour for this hurricane uh, as it passes by. And uh, the track has moved it a little bit closer as of our latest weather briefing to the um, Outer Banks area, and we couldn't see increased winds if it becomes uh, closer <laughs> still. 
uh, in Corral and Wellhead in particular, trash pickup will be will take uh, place tomorrow as scheduled on Wednesday. However, it will be suspended on Saturday. So uh, don't look for that to happen until the following Wednesday. Um, something new for this year that, that we're doing is we're moving pumps in and pre-positioning them. Um, we have not done that in the past, and uh, Ben came up with that, and I applaud him for um, thinking that. Uh, we have five pumps coming into Kerala, with four of which are going to go into Ocean Sands and one in Whalehead to help get um, the water out of there as quickly as we can, if need be. We have the pumps up and running in Whalehead, uh, I believe, as we speak, to lower the groundwater to, ahead of the storm to help um, deal with some of the water coming in ahead of time. I think that was all I had for the storm. So that's it. Um, if you do remain, um, I wish everybody well and hope there's not much property damage. I'll turn it over to you, sir. Oh, thank you. Um, again, just um, the only thing I want to talk about was a storm coming, in, and we're going to get an update a little later from our uh, emergency management director um, on the storm with the latest updates. But yeah, if you lived here I and mean, you've been through the storm, there, there's areas that are going to flood, you know, the south end of the county, Walnut Island, you knew what happened a few years ago um, with the flooding. So take heed, watch the updates, watch the county's website. We're going to be putting updates on there, and y you know what's going to flood. You know, take precautions, and um, if you're told to get out, evacuate, just get to a safer place. Um, you know, first uh, responders um, will be out when they can. Um, if it gets conditions get too bad, they're not going to be able to get on the streets. So just remember that. Um, until until the conditions allow them to get out so just again just be careful out there um i know we you can call the county if you need some assistance um with that, i believe you can um, we'll get some more updates on the manager's report but again just be safe out there uh, just get prepared and um and again just be safe thanks thank you sir <coughs> mr Ethers. thank you mr chairman Last night while I was watching one of my favorite TV programs, Jeopardy, the question was what renowned author wrote the best-selling book, Leadership in Turbulent Times? And the answer was one of our general session speakers at our state county commissioners conference last month in Greensboro, Doris Goodwin. This is the caliber of people who attend these conferences, and we were very fortunate to be able to go. Commissioner Jarvis, Commissioner Etheridge, the county manager, and myself had the opportunity to attend sessions on law, economic development, ethics, corruption, the 2020 census, supporting our children, opioid e epidemic, uh, cyber attacks, Medicaid transformation, and the list goes on and on and on. It was a three-day workshop of learning and sharing with other fellow colleagues and we certainly hope that some of these things that we learn that we can put in practice here in Curry Tuck County and maybe in the months to come thank you thank you Commissioner Robot nothing to add this evening thank you Commissioner McCord um, just remember uh, with the upcoming storm coming up uh, report any down power lines to dispatch um, I mean you can pretty much when the storm time and everything you can call 911 uh, if you think something's not 911 callable 232-2424, always give that number for dispatch. They're open 24 hours a day. I always say they're open 24 hours a day twice. You don't forget 24. Um, so that's a non-emergency. Make sure you bring your pets inside and all that good stuff. I wrote down a bunch of notes. Um, and like I said, if you're staying, make sure you got plenty of supplies. And if you need help, you know, call 911. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Mr. Jarvis? Um, as Commissioner Etheridge mentioned, I had the pleasure of going to the North Carolina Association of County, County Commissioners Convention in Greensboro with hundreds of other representatives, and um, it was an incredible learning event. Uh, she mentioned um, some of the workshops that we attended and had the opportunity, um, but two that I attended, I didn't have a lot of expectations going in, but they blew me away. The first one was on um, embezzlement. And we started out by watching a very fascinating documentary uh, about the largest case of embezzlement uh, by a local government employee. She stole over $50 million over 20 years. Uh, and after the uh, documentary, there was a great discussion about how you prevent those kinds of 
even small-scale embezzlement from happening, and it was fascinating uh, about something I had no idea had happened in a small town in um, Illinois. Uh, the other one was on cyber attacks uh, and malware issues, and we started that w workshop with uh, counties around us uh, talking about <clears throat> their problems that they've had with cyber attacks. You think that doesn't happen in North Carolina, especially in areas like Hereford County, but they have been uh, victims as well. And so it was such a learning experience. I shared with uh, our county manager, the free websites and the free uh, different ways that uh, the federal government assists counties with making sure that they don't become victims of cyber attack and malware issues. Um, so this is the type of information that we really gleaned from these workshops. It was incredible. I invite you to go to Netflix if you haven't and watch all the Queen's horses about this case of embezzlement. As it might sound dry, but it was fascinating how this woman was able to pull that off for 20 years. Um, the last thing I have is this afternoon I received an update from Bland Baker from Trillium um, that the Medicaid transformation has been postponed for the entire state due, due to the continuing budget stalemate. All 100 counties now will transition on February 1st, 2020. Uh, and the open enrollment date now for all 100 counties is December 13, 2019. Uh, and more information I will I'll provide. We meet, uh, Trillium meets next week, and I will pass this information on to the appropriate people in the county. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item on the agenda is County Manager's Report. Mr. Stiglitz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, obviously, a lot of the focus um, today has been on the upcoming hurricane and the preparations that we're making. We have staged emergency personnel. We're going to work to um, have more personnel in the Outer Banks and on the mainland. We're going to actually double the presence that we have on the Outer Banks from a law enforcement standpoint. We're going to double the crews that we have in Corova just in case those places become isolated because of water over the roads. We are, if you, for folks out there that have questions or concerns, they, the number that they can reach out to first is 232-2115. We're setting up a call center there so folks can call in. That's um, for residents or also visitors as we get past the storm. Because of the timing of this, we're going to have folks who are coming here Sunday, uh, Saturday, and we're going to want to know about when we're going to reopen. I, I do not anticipate that occurring on Saturday at this time. We will get further information about uh, county offices. They will be um, open to schedule tomorrow. We'll make a determination after tomorrow's weather briefing as to what we're going to do Thursday. Um, at this time, I'd like to turn it over actually to our emergency management director, Mary Beth Noons. She's going to go over just quickly the 5 o'clock weather update and what it did to the model, how it changed just a little. But even these slight changes can make a rather large difference at this point in the game. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. Thank you for asking me to come up and speak <clears throat> today. Um, I wanted to let you know that the, there was a little bit of change, but not a lot of change uh, to the between the 2 o'clock and the 5 o'clock. And actually, if you look back at the um, prior uh, forecast, there's not much difference going back even further. There, and to be quite honest, it's making us a little nervous. It's kind of telling us they might not be as sure as they are trying to present. So um, there's a, a, not a high level of confidence that we have in this as far as how much rain we're going to receive and um, how long the winds are going to blow. So one of the things that changed between the 2 o'clock and the 5 o'clock is the length uh, that the storm will be here. So we, uh, two days ago, we were looking at a fairly quick movie, moving storm, the highest of the winds coming in very early Friday morning and being done by 10 o'clock in the morning and the rest of the day being beautiful. However, now um, it has stretched out. It is, uh, the, the winds are going to start moving in Thursday evening, um, late evening and it's going to uh, go through till mid-afternoon on, sa uh, I'm sorry, Friday. So um, it is slowing down a little bit once it comes up our coast and makes that turn. Uh, some of the um, uncertainty with the rain is the bands that come with this, and I'm sure most of you are aware of the, the bands that can move across and, and dump a whole lot of rain in one particular location. So we're keeping a close eye on those. Um, they're very hard for our forecasters to predict, so we just need to be ready, and that was one of the reasons for having the pumps ready. 
And um, I thank you all for your support. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. I don't have a question, but I would like to add one thing just to let everybody know. If you're on Knott's Island or if you're in Corolla or Corova or Grandy or whatever today, uh, a lot of the admin staff as well as some of the specialty units for the Sheriff's Department have, we have SUVs everywhere, so we're, we can get to anybody out there. So, I mean, just I want the citizens to know that. So that was something we'd done. That was on my list that I forgot to say. <laughs> Sorry. Can you give us that number again for the call center? Sure. It's, uh, I was just going to do that. Thank you. Um, the number is uh, 252, of course, 232-2115. That's the emergency management number, and we've opened that up to a call center so that we have several callers during regular business hours. I want to point that out. Um, I do have a detailed message on there to help people with some of the questions that um, they've been calling in with, so hopefully that message, if they call in, will, will answer what they need. Um, I would like to also um, encourage or discourage people from calling our non-emergency line for evacuation or um, uh, re-entry questions. Please go ahead and call the emergency management number. I don't have a question, but I would like to say I seen how y'all work in the past and work the telephones before and y'all do a fabulous job and nobody realizes how many hours y'all put in to help the citizens here in Curry Tuck and we certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Ditto to that. Yeah, well just one last comment. I did have the opportunity to sit, I believe it was last year, so do some EOC training yes. and observe the county and I'm gonna tell you it was very impressive. The county has got a great um, EOC um, plan in place. So I just want to let everybody know that it will be manned, staffed, and it's phenomenal to be to support our county. So thank you for that as well. Thank you. It's always nice to see how our county comes together and really, um, really gets this community through difficult times. Anything else? No. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So as the citizens have heard, the, the track of this storm is still it's very, it's, it's variable. And if it shifts to the west, it could cause tremendous damage in our community. So we shouldn't take it too lightly. Obviously, I'm, I'm new to the area, um, a new county manager. I will say one thing that, that has kept me calm through all of this is the staff that I've got behind me. They've all been through it several times, and they're very confident and very capable. So I'm very appreciative of their help. The only other thing that I would let folks know is that we will be activating the EOC, our Emergency Operations Center, tomorrow at 1 o'clock. And from there, that, that group of people will be either on call or in the building 24 hours a day until we get through the event, not just the storm, but through the cleanup and everything. And um, we have activated, just so that the board is aware, um, a debris site. I'll get more information about that and push that out to the board and, and let the public know about that as well so that as debris management becomes an issue, we're ready to, to move on that for cleanup. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, I did uh, skip over public comment this evening. I didn't have anyone signed up. I only have one person in the audience that might like to speak. <laughs> Interested in saying anything at public comment this evening? <laughs> Nothing? Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> next item on the agenda is uh, public hearings. PB 19-13, Kirtuck County, text amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance, Chapter 2, uh, Administration, Chapter 6, Subdivision and Infrastructure Improvements, and Chapter 10, Definitions and Measurements, to limit minor subdivisions to those without significant infrastructure improvements, i.e. road installed to NCDOT standards, fire hydrants, and fire ponds. It will also limit minor subdivisions from striping out along existing NCDOT maintained roads, this text amendment does not apply to family subdivisions, a type of minor subdivision. With that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Lucicero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The text amendment you have before you tonight, um, it, it does address minor subdivisions, and let me uh, explain. Minor subdivisions are, are those of five lots or fewer that uh, are along an existing uh, road and do not require major infrastructure, such as a fire hydrant. Um, <clears throat> at the at your January retreat this year, um, the board directed staff to address uh, the use of these minor subdivisions, especially along some existing roads that we're seeing a lot of uh, new development along. Um, there are also uh, an interpretation in our fire code that requires um, three, three or more lots 
uh, did subdivision three or more lots to meet fire safety standards. That would include a road built to be able to hold a fire truck, um, fire hydrants, uh, fire water lines, fire hydrants, and fire ponds going in. Um, this additional level of infrastructure, staff felt like it needed an additional uh, review by our technical review committee. Um, <clears throat> this text amendment is also going to bring our minor subdivisions into compliance with the general statutes regarding the division of land for an estate or a probated will. <clears throat> so we've added some additional definitions, um, uh, con a connecting street, a dead-end street, a residential collector street, uh, subdivision access street. All these are going to be uh, added to Section 10 of the UDO. And we're also going to, um, in for uh, street standards for exempt subdivision, state that no more than one private access street uh, shall meet the parent parcel as existed on April 2nd, 1989. <clears throat> So you're asking why are we addressing, why are we worried about this? Well, this is an example that has come in over the last couple of months. This is uh, Sunrise Estates that has taken place in, in Idlet. And this is Idlet Road coming in. And these are all existing. And, and there's Narrow Shore going to the north. This is Idlet Road. Um, these are all existing DOT roads, and they're coming in and they're creating, uh, I think, 17 or 18 new properties along existing NC DOT roads, which may not be that big a deal along these streets because they're dead end roads, but we've also seen it happen on other more highly trafficked roads. Um, here's Baxter Lane. We're also seeing the minor subdivisions come in. The lighter green. Uh, lots are the ones or minor subdivisions that came in first. These are two minor subdivisions in anticipation of a major subdivision coming in here. Um, and the reason for this is typically you would want all these lots accessing an internal street. That's just usually have a better, higher quality of a development that way. Um, you don't create a traffic issue on your existing roads by adding new accesses. Uh, here's another one where the darker, the darker green um, are the, uh, the minor subdivisions that came in. You could do five lots at a time along an existing road. And the teal color is, is the major subdivision. So all these, the green lots were done prior to uh, a major subdivision coming in. <clears throat> here's one along Tolls Creek Road where uh, we do have access standards on Tolls Creek Road. But these were done with two different minor subdivisions across the road from each other um, that could potentially create access uh, issues with, uh, with lots of driveway cuts along Tolls Creek Road. Uh, and this is another one along East Ridge Road. So the, the lighter uh, properties, the smaller ones, those are all minor subdivisions. And the dark green are the 10 plus acre exempt subdivisions. So. <clears throat> Let me go over what some of this does. Um, it does uh, our, a no review subdivision. Um, we've added to that so that it addresses the North Carolina General Statute um, to allow a no review subdivision if you're settling an estate or a probated will. This does limit minor subdivisions to three or fewer lots, um, that, and these three or fewer lots would not require any new infrastructure. Um, it sets a new standard for private access streets. Um, they are now required to meet the fire code, so that would be 20 feet of road and 24 feet of right-of-way designated. It, des it defines, this text amendment defines annual average daily traffic, infrastructure, connecting street, dead-end street, residential collector street, and <coughs> subdivision access street. So we presented this to the planning board, uh, and they were concerned about that, that it could limit some development potential uh, along existing NCDOT, right, D, NC, NCDOT maintained streets. So um, this is where there's two different versions of this text amendment in your packet. So staff's version was that there would be no new lots on existing uh, NCDOT maintained roads in the county, but the, uh, the planning board felt that that was a little bit too limiting. So 
they limit um, minor subdivisions um, on NCDOT roads if the average annual daily traffic daily trips are 500 trips or less or there's a posted speed limit of 25 miles per hour or less so that's there's a lots of different um, uh, language in in your packet but that's the gist that is the main point uh, of this minor subdivision text amendment so staff does recommend approval of this of this text amendment and we believe it is uh, the request is consistent with the 2006 land use plan policy HN4 Curry Tech County shall discourage all forms of housing from leapfrogging into the midst of farmland and rural areas thereby eroding agricultural resource base of the county policy TR5 so as to preserve the traffic moving function of the county's primary roads minimize traffic accidents and avoid landlocking interior parcels Curry Tech County shall discourage residential and commercial strip development along the county's primary roads and policy CA1, the important economic tourism and community image benefits of attractive functional major highway corridors through Curry Tuck County shall be recognized. The request is reasonable and in the public interest because a higher level of view is required for subdivisions installing significant infrastructure. Example, roads installed to NCDOT standards, fire hydrants, fire ponds. This type of subdivision must be reviewed by the technical review committee and not administratively approved by the planning director alone. Limit this limits driveway cuts along existing roads, preserves the traffic function of the road, and minimizes traffic accidents. And to have a higher quality of development, it is important to mandate internal streets at more than two lots. Um, so with that, I will take any questions that the board may have. Uh, uh, get anything that you, uh, can you back up to a couple of the examples you just cited? Are any of these mm -hmm. current, uh, are these on 25 mile an hour roads? I'm just interested to see the difference. Do you know that we probably kept? This is East Ridge Road, so I mean, this is not 25 miles an hour. That's not 25, hour. but that's not a high traffic road neither. Right. Yeah. Um, one, an example here may be Baxter Lane. I'm not so sure what Baxter it is. Lane, is it I mean, Baxter Lane's with the connectivity. I mean, they can enter it from Baxter Lane. They can enter it from Mayock Lane. That one's kind of unique. Mm -hmm. okay. It surprised me that the annual, uh, but it was the average annual daily <laughs> Traffic was the lowest one of all of them because Baxter. not much out there. But, yeah. but, but can't I mean, the speed limit change though? It's not a constant. I mean, that that speed limit sign could be changed. Somebody well, could, that's, man, I'm, yeah. well, I mean, I'm just saying it could speed be. limit signs could be changed, <clears throat> so it could change the development's aspect. Then, yeah. I mean, and, that's and the only thing I'm concerned about because I mean, you may I, have 45 one time now, be dropped down to 25, and somebody's planning on doing something or. I mean, it just it could change and change. And East Ridge has some spots where it's slower, but it's not 25. Well, if you're, if you're if, it's it's improved. Yeah. yeah. If you're 25, you're probably not going to go up, then right? Just it, speed no, limits. If you're 45, you could go down. Where it could and go down. Well, the right proximity of houses so a lot of times affects speed limits, does it not? To the road, how close they are to the road, that kind of thing. <laughs> so, are you guys? Um, was, was, planning, was planning staff uh, okay with the planning board's recommendation, or did, would you rather see your version of it? I guess um, this is a big question of the day. So, well, what, what's your drawback on the? What's uh, the yeah? What's the, what is the problem with um, having the 25 uh, mile an hour speed limit or the 500 average daily traffic? Well, ideally, in the situation that it's in here um, on this situation it, it would have been better if this had been done with internal streets instead of um, creating lots along an existing DOT along existing roads it's just a little bit not as high quality development as we would have if they would it would have been brought in and a better lot arrangement um, so in that vein the planning staff would like to see you know no more uh, situations like this and this is an extreme case because there were so many um, this property was surrounded by yeah. four and so, it, you know this isn't this is a DOT as for, uh, you know on the ARPO DOT discourages uh, they call them curb cuts mm -hmm. you know the less times that there is a driveway 
it is, it's a, I think it, it proves to be safer if there's only, you know, access points. So why know. would we make an exception then? If it's be, a safety issue, why make an exception? I think it's because it's not a very heavily traveled road with the but 500 couldn't that trips. Change? I mean, couldn't that change if subdivisions? Could. It, it, it could, but the layout of our county, we do have just, especially when you get into to lower Curry Tuck, you're very limited by the topography. I mean, you're very limited. You're going out to the sound, essentially. Um, so there are a significant number of uh, dead-end streets or streets that loop around and have, don't carry uh, some of the traffic that we're seeing in some of the Moyoc, um arterials and, street, and, and collectors. Um, so I understand the planning board wanting to still have that option available for development on these lower traffic roads and um, with lower uh, ADTs and lower um, speed limits. Was there one for Narrow Shores Road? Was there an a ADT for um, Narrow Shores? I don't remember seeing that up there. I was just curious. Narrow Shores Road, I see Macedonia. Probably see. the one up in Isla? Yeah, the one in Isla. Because, I mean, Narrow Shores Road is not a heavily traffic road. It's not. It's a dead end down there. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there are several, like, 15 to 30 lot subdivisions up there off of there north of north of where this is taking place well so I think one of the takeaways from you that I'm getting one of the bigger takeaways is that if we have a single cut obviously there's a safety issue but it's gonna uh, inspire a better product to be turned out basically and yes. thereby raise property values etc okay no. Laurie if it, will you go back to um, the subdivision I guess it was the one on Baxter Station. The other issue that we heard from the board in January is something with this example, essentially that minor subdivision should have been incorporated into the entire subdivision. So it was more, more of a holistic project. Instead, you, you quickly try to chop out five lots at a time by sticking them on a road that already exists you can sell those five lots and in some cases go back to Eastridge it creates the capital to do the rest of the project but look at how many cuts are in there yeah. and that's in like a quarter mile yeah mm -hmm. and 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 Commissioner Beaumont is right that the more curb cuts you have it's increases right. the chance for people to back out into the road right it's I'm sorry. Rare. You yes can sir <laughs> um, it, it it has a lot of negative impacts on a road. Not only does it not only does, is it a safety issue, but it also causes more congestion on a road. The more curb cuts that you have, it's from, from a, a traffic engineer, which yeah. can get up here and explain that in a lot more detail than I can. So. We don't. Someone could basically, if they own say 50 acres, just go a five lot subdivision, jump over here and do another one, jump over here and do another one. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's what you were seeing. Yeah. We were seeing that happen. That's what we were seeing happen. Mm -hmm. They were beating the system. The, this one along Tolls Creek, where they're facing each other along Tolls Creek, the lighter, the lighter green is, uh, are two minor subdivisions that are facing each other. The new TVs are so big, I can't. Which, which one is that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like I said, it's so big, I'm used to squinting. Right, right, right. right. I can't see what I'm seeing. This four. <laughs> That's right. There. Yeah, I know. Okay, I know where, where it's like the, well, I always relate the numbers. It's like the 2000 block of Toll Street Road. Okay. That's the cop, that's the cop car coming out. I, got yeah, yeah, I, I know where okay. you're coming about. Because the, the ones to the right are the bigger lots that back up to the woods. And just a little bit further north of that is um, Launch Landing Road and all that good stuff. Yes. Okay. I couldn't tell which one that was. Well, now, the, the study on Baxter, that said 260 average annual daily trips a day. But, I mean, that was done in 2014. And it, like I said, I know sometimes, and, and I do this all the time, too, when we're working for the Sheriff's Department, we'll cut down Moyoc Land and Drive, and you can cut it. There's so many cut-throughs, you can cut down by the off of um, Shingle Landing Road and get to back. I mean, there's so many. There's, well, that was is the that maybe what connected. factored that in? Because I know, well, some of those weren't even there then. So that was done in 2014. It went in 2014. There's a traffic generator, um, and when we talked about this in one of our other meetings, previous meetings, um, but a single-family home essentially generates, I think the, the rule of thumb is like nine and a half trips a day. 
and then you count going out and coming back in. So if you have, you know, a, a couple, a family that the husband goes out, that's one trip out, then the wife goes out to work or whatever. And so each trip, so that's nine and a half trips a day, you soccer practice out and in, and all of a sudden you're at six. Um, so the, in Baxter Lane, I guess maybe some of those houses weren't built there in, in 2014, which is why we're at such a 260. The lowest number. Mm -hmm. It was interconnectivity, I believe, through the one part because the, the neighborhood that Ryan Holmes built wasn't there then. Right. I, mean, I, I run radar on Brunsey Road, and I live <clears> on <throat> Brunsey Road. Seven, ten a day is just, it's kind of high. I don't know, but I mean, like I said, I mean, they could have done it in the summer of 2017 or something. Okay. I got a question, Lori, just regarding the, the fire code. I know we're, um, there's requirements for fire hydrants and, and on occasions, ponds. Is there a case where if, if approved shuttling, water shuttling is approved, could that, could that take the place of, let's say, an, a, a fire pond if, if it's approved and it's been... I, I, I'm, well, I'll start it. And then, I, I just... Um, I, I, there, for single-family homes, there's a certain number, of, a fire flow number that you have to meet mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> by, the, by the building code. And um, you can get that with having a fire pond on the property or potentially shuttling if that's the preferred method. Um, Which is not. So. Um, okay, well, because I've, I've been asked that question a few sure, times, so I sure. want to ask about it so, again. So can you, if you, can you meet it that way? Yes. Is it ideal to meet it that way? We're not sure. To, in order for that to happen, the fire department has to be certified by the Department of Insurance to shuttle water at a certain amount of water. Crawford Fire Department, for instance, has that. Um, right now, the system we have in place requires the developer to bear the cost of providing water to their subdivision. If we went to shuttling, a, you, you, I haven't done the study, but you might need more apparatus, you might need manpower. I'm not saying it's feasible because you can't do it all over the place, yeah. but if a certain situation... But you'd have to do it in a, in a fire district as a whole. So either the whole fire district can do it or none of the fire districts can do it. Okay. So the, and the issue for us as a county staff is before we would change our code to allow a lesser amount of fire flow that would be more likely to be covered through water shuttling, we would want all of the, for instance, mainland fire departments to be certified before we would make that change. So you could be talking about extra expense for apparatus, for instance, just to make that happen. I, I do believe one of the reasons Crawford is capable of that is they have a, a tanker that's um, 2,500 gallons, I think. So it makes a, a difference what size tank I mean, Lower Kirtuck has a There's large a tank, too, yeah. But, but, but yeah, yeah, and I think with the, uh, I think the way, that, I mean, the mutual aid helped you know, with that. Yeah, and okay, so, so, so the challenge with that is that's the purpose of the tanker task force, and that was heavily worked through with the FIAB amongst the departments to ensure that if that's, a, if that's called out, that water is flowing. It, I mean, I want to say almost every tanker in the county responds to ensure it doesn't matter where in the county it is, you're going to have tankers rolling in with, with a lot of water. So, and, and so I'm not sure why Crawford decided to get certified. They did, not it. They did it. Lower they did it because of ISO. They wanted, they were looking for an ISO and then they worked hard and they proved yeah. the concept and, and away it went. Um, that was the precursor to the tanker task force and I would argue that with mutual aid that we've got that. So the fire departments would have to request certification. The certification, agreed. But why we would withhold Crawford's, you know, or the Crawford Fire District benefiting from what they went and out. At. In other words, your comment about until the entire mainland certified, we don't do anything differently. I would suggest that that was the benefit of the volunteers in that district that they pursued it, they executed it, and they they got it done. So, so I think I think part of the issue is right now our code requires that you meet ISO standards. There is a lesser fire flow required under a different set of standards. 
Um, and so if we went with that different set of standards and reduced the fire flow, it could potentially help development in Crawford if they didn't want to put a fire pond in. But then the question becomes, now all of a sudden staff has got different development requirements in different parts of the county for that. And ultimately, and here's kind of the big takeaway, we're only talking about parcels that develop without water lines nearby, which are not, the bulk of the development that we see in Currituck County occurs within district within a distance that needs a fire hydrant. And then I'm not saying we need to adjust our yeah our, our, our standards to let develop. I'm just saying if if uh, if if the tank or task force can meet that requirement that's currently in place, you know, why isn't that an option, I guess? It'd be up to the individual fire departments. So first of all, the individual fire departments would have to get certified. Now they may be able to use the tank or task force to accomplish that. But the other issue is we would need to make sure that their contract stipulated that they would shuttle water. Because if we have a subdivision that builds out without a fire pond, because we're depending on water shuttling from the fire departments, and then something changes in the fire department, the leadership or whatever, and they say, we don't want to shuttle water anymore. But our county is covered with houses and subdivisions that don't have a fire pond and aren't accessible to and and you know an aspect of how we got here in the first place I think I have I take issue with okay you know in, and I'm just saying look throughout this state of North Carolina and you're not going to have a fire pond you're not going to have a water source and they're still building houses so we um we question <clears throat> that as well and so our chief building inspector reached out to the state as well as our state house representative reached out to the department of the fire or office of the fire marshal and the response that representative Hannig got was that in fact Currituck County is enforcing the code correctly and the rest of the state is not I mean that that I mean that's basically what the email said yeah enforcing the code correctly and that that's, that's true I'm sure but the other caveat to that, though, I mean, enforcing the code could be providing the proper shuttle service when, when it can be. I guess, what, I, I guess what I'm looking at is if we're the only, if we're one of nine, if we're one of 100 counties that are, have gone to this, it's, there's a problem well, in the, the state. The Office and of so, State Fire Marshal did say there were other counties doing it. I just don't think they're necessarily in, in our region. Can I ask the... Um, when you said it said in the sentence, I can't remember which page, but I wrote this down. They have to have hydrants and ponds. Is it and or or both? Or. Or. Okay. Either or. Either or. The other thing, like you said, and I know recently, on the south end of the county, we had a fire, and the fire pond was dry. Was bone was dry. dry. So I mean, and they had to have shuttling. And they had to have shuttling, and you know, I mean, like I said, so part of that problem, if I recall, that's that older. We're not well. They probably didn't build the pond. It was an older subdivision. It wasn't yeah. a very big. <clears throat> so. And ultimately, our goal is just to make sure that we've got the water to fight a fire. I have, like I said, as, as county manager, I have no problem with shuttling as a solution. We just need the fire departments to get. They have to be certified through the DOI. And that's all. And that's all I was asking. With this, is is if 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 that can be done by shuttling i mean that's sh to me that should be acceptable i would think but ben didn't you tell me when we met about this issue that that is going to take a while it's not like that's a solution for tomorrow correct well, that's correct it's a, a lengthy process to, to do this so if we change it it's going to be a good length of time before we are able to do that, that that's correct because first of all you would need you would have to have the departments to get certified the shuttle we would also need language in the contracts that would guarantee that they would shuttle because like I said we wouldn't want something to change in the department and that not be a contractual obligation then we don't have water to fight a fire and that's I just I know lower curve talk I mean I'm part of it down there I mean we do practicing what, what shuttles yeah I know Crawford does too I mean any time that I've responded to assist fire we always have plenty of water <laughs> but yeah, I mean like, just saying that I mean there's always that's not never been a problem yeah so there is a path forward so that we could not require on fire ponds but it's probably a process that would take I mean, the, the contracts right now, I think, are in place for a couple more years. So unless we wanted to go try to amend fire contracts mid-year, then it's something that we would we'd have to address when the contracts come up for renewal. You said that the fire department, the fire 
department in Raleigh had said that we were in compliance with what we were doing. And it's been mentioned, well, others aren't in the state. Well, that doesn't matter to me if we're doing something that's supposed to be done to protect the citizens, we should do it. It doesn't matter if nobody else in the state is doing it. Yeah, and, and, and don't misunderstand me. I didn't say take anything away. We can just add another piece to this to make it even better. Yeah, like I said, I mean, I think our goal is just to make sure that the, the water is provided. And the ability yes. to fight the fire. Yep. Yeah. Um, but there's a, there's a path forward for that, but it, it won't be a quick process necessarily. If they all get certified, they can come back and change the ordinance. Yeah, I mean, if all the fire departments were certified and it was in the contract, actually staff could mm -hmm. would probably champion an ordinance that would make some changes that would let that happen. happen. We have a volunteer fire department mm -hmm. system in the mainland and it's great that they can that they do what they get done and I'm certainly not suggesting that just because we're the only ones enforcing that everybody else is causing risk or causing whatever I think ironic to me that the same group that has this policy won't allow us to require sprinkler systems in 23 bedroom houses in the Outer Banks. So I am under no misconceptions that there's something else going on behind the scenes. We've been building houses like this for eternity and well, not eternity in the county. And so there's something else afoot. I don't believe that your house is any less protected by a fire pond or not. Because at the end of the day, if the vo volunteers don't show up, I don't care how much water you have, your house is going to burn to the ground. And that's just the risk that you accept when you move into a rural community served by volunteers that do the best that they can with what they're able to, what they're provided. What I'm trying, what I am concerned about is, you know, and we've had all kinds of property right discussions, you know, you want to put in a five lots, and I understand five lot here, five lot here, five lot here. I am not in favor of that whatsoever. But if you've got a simple five lot subdivision going in and you're required to then take, because those are typically one acre, you know, five one acre parcels, to then say you're going to have to drop a fire pond in, technically, is it part of the subdivision or is it each house going to have to be required and responsible for providing their own water? I, I'm not impressed with this requirement and I made that abundantly clear on multiple occasions with you in talking with with chief he too has a conceptual issue with what we're trying to accomplish here so I think the solution is water shuttle but going back nothing is ever a guarantee you know we had a we had a house that caught fire that plugged into the fire into a fire hydrant, and we sprayed 105,000 gallons of water on a house, and the house still burned to the ground. Water is not the only; no. it, that's not the fix-all. And so, if if that's the if that's the aspect that we're focusing on, I think I, I think it's it's not legitimate. It's not really. And, is that and what if this we're, is focusing on? Is that what this uh, is I'm sorry? focusing no, on? I, th I think uh, that's I was thinking. Uh, but that's th not what this is focusing on, right, th though, right? This, this is, is clarifying focusing... uh, what a problem has been uh, that has reared its head because of these minor subdivisions, right? We found out that we needed to be enforcing, or we were, and, it, and it's just raised some concerns. So uh, uh, at this point, I guess we're just we're codifying it really and saying you have to have this now and we're, we're letting people know going we're forward. putting in the udo what is in the fire code right is what's going on right so that's there for everyone to see and so yes to your point that's not the the main point is to change these minor subdivisions and and then doing so bring to light the fire code which i don't think any of us uh i think we all are in agreement that shuttling works just has worked just fine and it's and so we would need to change the UDO to allow for uh, to change our the standard is that what you're saying That's so the, so essentially if fire if water shuttling is the path we want to go to satisfy the state requirement which I, is which is I, no no I'm, don't give me not to change it I would not take something and put this in place of it just add another means 
It, well, that's what well, he's that's saying. What saying. To get, oh, I thought you were saying yeah. take water shuttling, out. fire pond, or fire hydrant okay. system. Right. All the above. Correct. Correct. And, I, and so I think, and that's where I. Okay. Yeah, to offer that as an option okay. to meet the state requirement, we would need the fire departments to be certified. I think, from a staff perspective, we would recommend having that in the fire contract. Um, you, we have we have percentages of performance criteria as part of that contract. Yeah. Um, and then finally, then we would come through, we'd have to amend not this section of the UDO, this might be part of it, but there are other sections of the UDO that would have to be amended, because right now we recognize ISO standards, and we'd have to go with NFPA, I think I got that acronym right, but my acronyms are jumbled a little bit, mm -hmm. so, um, but, but, so there's a, there's a process forward, but the first step would be getting, so let's say we took Crawford, let's say we got one that's already certified, and we're comfortable that their contract requires that they shuttle water if needed. And I'm not saying that I am right now. I'd have to look more in depth into it. Then you'd have to go through and amend the UDO, but you'd have to amend the UDO to state that only districts who have that certification and have language in the contract guaranteeing it, so forth. You and can't so guarantee it. You can't guarantee that a fire pond is going to work. You can't guarantee that there's going to be enough fire in, that is water an, in the tower. That it is an expected response. Is that a better? It, their response, I, I would suggest, because having worked that contract, there is a percentage of you got to respond 75% of the time A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Yeah. All we have to do, I would suggest, is add water shuttling as part of that response, yeah. which they would consider that's part of their normal response. Yeah. It's not a 100% guarantee. It's not. And so, so that process can, can happen for sure. Um, I think that we're, we're losing focus a little bit on, on a separate issue. And that's something that staff can definitely move forward with. But the amendment before you tonight is not just about the, the – the water. I understand. No, no, I understand. I was just – you know, when I was looking at this, I wanted to bring it up as in a – make it known that – going forward we need to look at that yeah. as an option to meet our fire requirements yeah. for developments not not that this changes anything that we're focused on right now i understand what we're trying to get accomplished i just wanted to bring it up i had numerous people call me about it why isn't it an option something staff can probably look into yep and, and we can and we have been looking into <laughs> yeah. it because we've heard those same concerns and complaints um, <laughs> I'm sorry, just to clarify, this language says that if you have to put that infrastructure in, the pond, the fire hydrant, that you just have to go through our technical review committee process because it's something that, that maybe the fire departments would need to weigh in on, or chief building inspector. Uh, it would take through the whole committee and not just leave it up to planning staff to approve. If you, if you have to put that level of infrastructure in, it will kick you into just a higher level of review. Speaking of the chief building inspector, Got him right. He just came in. <laughs> well, like, like I said, I don't want to lose focus of what the amendment's about tonight. So, um, so, so the question before the board is: is we've got these two different versions of this text amendment. One of them, which the staff put together, that, that states you have to go through that that uh, process that Laurie just laid out if you were going to access um, anything, any currently state maintained road. Currently, state yeah, um, and the planning board version that has the 500 trips a day and 24 miles per hour. Did I get that right, Laurie? Or did I get it wrong? Yes, 500 average an, average annual daily trips or the 25 miles an hour. So, okay. So, are we, have we had enough discussion with? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Shuttling. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And one more. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. One more thing that um, staff would recommend: um, uh, a delayed effective date on this, so that any projects that that people may have in the works, um, 60 to potentially 90 days, um, they could shore those up and, and get them into uh, into staff and us review them. So a, a delayed effective date would uh, be another staff recommendation. First of the year. First of the year. All right. Thank you, Ms. Cicero. Mr. Stackletter. Um at this time I will open. Oh, if I can just make Sorry. one point. Um, with, with the extended time frame, the only concern that, that staff would have is that if you set a time frame of 90 days, you're going to have 
a whole bunch of applications come in in 90 days. So you could, if there's a project out there, you could set it so that as long as they make application within a certain period of time, within the next, you know, 30 days or whatever. I mean, that's that's the only concern that that we would have with that extended time. Okay. So, um, but but anyway, just that's just something to to think about. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. At this time, I will open the uh, public comment. Uh, do not have anyone signed up. Did you, did you like to make a comment this evening, sir? I didn't actually come to speak on this issue, okay. but uh, I well, thought we'll, we'll need your name and I'm all Mark that good Crystal, stuff. I'm Mark Crystal, and uh, I'm at uh, 3512 uh, Crowtown Highway in Kitty Hawk. Um, I just wanted to mention that the planning board thought that, and the reason they suggested some amendments, is they thought it was overly restrictive. And one example that was discussed was if there is an existing subdivision that has a residual parcel in it where a developer could potentially develop one or two more lots on an existing subdivision road, he would be prohibited from doing that if NCDOT had already taken that road over. And it may not make sense to build a new road off of that existing subdivision road to try to serve one or two more lots that happen to front on that road. So it seemed like there should be exceptions uh, that would be allowed uh, to just, you can't put any lots on a DOT road. Even though the subdivision's been platted? Yes. But the, that's a subdivision. If a, developer, not... if a developer still owned that road and hadn't dedicated, DOT hadn't well, accepted I... it for maintenance, then he would be able to do it, but if D, but he, you have essentially the same situation. If DOT happens to have accepted that road for maintenance, so this would pre prohibit an, another lot from fronting on that road. Laurie, the, just just for clarification, does it say that you can't do it, or it has to go through a different process? You would have to go through a different process. So it's not disallowing you the ability to do it. It just says you have to go through more steps to make it happen. Like if, yeah. For this, if he, if, um, and I can, it may take me a minute, but I can pull the example specifically that Mr. Bissell uh, is referring to. Um, but we would, pr would like to see that as part of a phase development or um, a complete subdivision in front of us and know that once DOT takes over the first property it would be the second the second phase would then could go but Mr. Uh, Bissell was specifically talking about um, off of Sanderson Court. Yeah, let me let just can we go back to a um, let's look at the one you had on Baxter Lane for example let's say that there was a vacant parcel between Arrowhead and Little Acorn somewhere on in that existing Little Acorn Road. Let's say there was a residual parcel, Little Acorn. Between Little Acorn and Arrowhead. There you go. Like I'll right say, here? Well, let's say one, of the, one or two of those lots hadn't been developed for whatever reason. Let's say there was a, a different property owner and that wasn't part of the subdivision and now all of a sudden that property became available to this developer and he was wanted to purchase what could be one or two of those lots internally to that subdivision. Would he be able to develop those without building an additional road? Well, the property owner would only be, only be given approval to run the road across his property for one. Right, and like in the Wood of Acorn, you'd, you'd extend the stub to, to encompass those new lots. And No, like, he's actually saying on Little Acorn, two of those lots weren't part of that subdivision. They say two of those lost then again. And then all of a sudden, now they are. Right. I, I, I believe the language, the, subdivision. the language would allow you to do that, but you'd have to go through the process. It wouldn't be a minor subdivision process at that point. It would point. be a major subdivision Correct. process. Correct. Yeah. So it's not disallowing it. It's just <clears throat> saying that it has to go through well, more we, review. And we would rather the cuts occur in a subdivision than you're not, yeah, you're not cutting on a main road, main artery. So the 25 mile an hour speed limit, I mean, that's not really, I don't even see the purpose because yeah. you're still cutting, you're still cutting into main roads. 
Right. And if it's already platted as a subdivision and there's a road in the subdivision, there's still a process to add to it. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. okay. I just want to make sure. I don't that even know many roads in the county where we have a 25 mile park. I was sitting there trying mm. to think. Well, and we're back to this is the this is the extreme case where okay. um, uh, we have these these four or yeah, four DOT maintained roads, and they've gone in and created 17 new lots, 17 or 18 new lots along here. Um, where they do you do I mean this is a dead end if you're going to do this this is the place to do it however it still would be better if you, you brought the street into it had a, a little bit better lot design but um, this is currently allowed under our ordinance so one, one other issue that comes up with safety and, and this is it's not the big point but it is a point is um, school bus routes and so if that, if that subdivision had internal streets, then all of a sudden the school bus stops internally. Right now, with the way that's laid out, if there's a kid stop, at each stop, 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 couple stop. of houses, the school bus is stopping all the way down. I stop on Guinea Road about 11 times, it's just, you know, because it's a high traffic road. I don't yeah. think Not saying that that's a major issue, but, I mean, still an those issue. are the kinds of things that when Laurie, Miss LaCicero is talking about internal streets, it makes some difference. So. And I think that makes good sense. But if, going back to the example that that I was hypothetically uh, <laughs> referring to, the, what, what are you cooking, Mark? You're just you're saying that what I'm the situation that I described could be approved. It would just take a board approval rather than a staff approval. Is that correct? Well, what should we do then? Major subdivision at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yes, I believe that's correct from the staff perspective. Yes. Which the, 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 what was expressed to us at the planning retreat was that the board wanted to see more of these smaller subdivisions because of what was happening with curb cuts and so forth on, on some of these roads. Now, and I, I would venture to say um, if we see less of this because of the changes, we probably would at some point revert it back to the staff and not have it come to us as, as frequently decreasing our workload, but that's for future boards to figure out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mark. All right. Seeing no one else in the audience for uh, public comment, I'll close public comment. And uh, more discussion from the board on this? I'll open the floor for a motion. Suggest a motion to. Look, I mean, it might be shot down, but sorry. I was going to suggest a motion to continue this till Commissioner Etheridge was here to our next, since we didn't have a lot on the agenda tonight. But no, no, that's the next item, old business. I know we discussed this, and I know that some of the miners were abused, and I agree with that. But some of the fire stuff, like what we talked about, the different things. But either or, I mean, if I don't have the support for it, we'll vote on it. Were you making a motion? I was making a motion to continue it <laughs> just because, like I said, I mean, this one's, I know I read this yesterday, but I was also thinking about all the different things I had to do for the hurricane, so it didn't put a lot of thought into it. Do we have a second? Okay, motion dies for lack of a second. Anyone else like to proffer a motion? I'll make a motion to approve PB 1913 um, as the staff uh, has written because the request is consistent with the land use plan. Uh, it discourages subdivisions from leapfrogging into the midst of farmland and rural areas as it erodes the agricultural resource base of the county. It preserves the traffic moving function of the county's primary roads, minimizes traffic accidents, and avoids landlocking interior land parcels with strip residential development on the county's mainland roads, which allows more steady traffic and minimizes traffic accidents from excessive driveway cuts and usage. And it provides for more functional highway corridors by limiting the number of driveway, uh, driveway accesses along those corridors. And it is reasonable and in the public interest because the fire code standards apply to minor subdivisions that create two more lots, except family subdivisions, 
additional infrastructure is required. It is necessary for more departments and agencies to review the subdivision request since the subdivision can no longer be administratively approved by the planning uh, planner director. A full technical review committee review is necessary just as major subdivisions are reviewed. Um, and it is logical to review a full, uh, to require a full uh, TRC review of subdivisions installing infrastructure and limiting excess driveway cuts along existing roads to create an orderly development pattern. Thank you. Any further discussion from the board? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Hearing none, carries unanimously. Thank you all. Next item on the agenda is old business. Item A, consideration of an ordinance amending Article 1, Chapter 13, and Article 2, Chapter 13 of the Kirtuck County Code of Ordinances to provide for the time for the time water and sewer service is committed to a service applicant. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. McCree. Mr. Chairman, this ordinance is back before the board for its second reading, having passed its first reading at your last meeting uh, by a majority vote, but under state law, uh, requires a return uh, for a second reading uh, because there was not a, a full membership of the board in attendance at the last meeting. Tonight it may be adopted by a simple majority vote. Uh, as we explained at the last meeting, uh, this ordinance uh, is an amendment to our uh, wa water and wastewater ordinances and specifically uh, the time within which or at which a system development fee must be paid by an individual who has subdivided property or is otherwise uh, developing property. So the ordinance on page uh, 2 at, at line 14 uh, defines what a system development fee is. It was formerly, I guess, known or considered to be w what we knew as an impact fee. The General Assembly in uh, the last year or so amended state law uh, to, to limit or provide specifically uh, the manner in which a county or city may impose a system development fee to charge uh, assessments for impacts to water and sewer or other utility systems. So this ordinance, first of all, will provide within the water section of our utility ordinance a definition for system development fee, which comes from the state law. It then provides in part two of the ordinance, uh, amending section 13-10, to provide the time when the system development fee for water must be paid uh, and, and provides that the system development fee shall be paid at the time of application for a building permit or site plan approval. This was, this was uh, to address and in response to a concern from the development community in the county uh, that they not be required to uh, pay as state law uh, appeared to require uh, payment uh, of the system development fee at the time that the water was obligated or at the time that a final plat was recorded, uh, whichever came first. So this gives them some relief and allows for them to pay for uh, the, the system development fee for water at the time that they make application for the building permit, which of course is usually sometime after final recordation of a plat. Continuing on to page uh, this is the wastewater section of our utilities ordinance. It again adds uh, a system development fee definition. And then with regard to wastewater, uh, it does provide that if the new, new development involves the subdivision of land, the system development fee shall be assessed when the final plat is recorded. Um, the county believes, county staff believes that we have sufficient water resources and assets that we could uh, meet an obligation for water um, if, if system development fee is paid for at the time a building permit is applied for. However, wastewater is a little bit different and thus the requirement that a system development be fee be paid at an earlier phase of the development uh, than it would be the case with water. Uh, as I stated at the last meeting when this was presented, uh, this comes with some caution uh, because there, there may be the, uh, some uh, eventuality where uh, a developer has a subdivision with a number of lots left or people have bought lots and have not yet applied for a building permit and for some reason the county not have the ability 
to provide water for development of that particular lot at the time. I don't think we believe that would happen, but it is a possible consequence of changing payment of a system development fee and, the, and receiving an obligation to provide water at a later stage in development than what state law appeared to earlier require and, and under which the county was proceeding prior to receiving concerns from the development community. I'd be glad to answer any <coughs> questions. Any questions for Ms. McCree? Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, having none, I'll open the floor for a motion. I move to approve the ordinance amending Article 1, Chapter 13, and Article 2, Chapter 13 of the Curry Tuck County Code of Ordinance to provide for the water, time water and sewer service is committed to a, to a service applicant. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, sir. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None carries unanimously. Next item, new business. A, board appointments. Number one, Corova Beach Road Service District Advisory. This is to appoint two new people. And um, at this time, I will move to um, appoint the individuals as presented by staff. I'll second it. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, carries unanimously. Next item, Ocean Sands North Crown Point Watersh Watershed District Advisory. Uh, again, I will move to uh, appoint the individuals as presented by staff. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next item, B, Consent Agenda. Four for a motion on the Consent Agenda. So move. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And at this time, I um, need a motion to adjourn the Meeting of the Board of Commissioners. So move. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 At this time, I'll open the special meeting of the Tourism Development Authority, and we have TDA budget amendments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the first budget amendment before you tonight with the TDA is to increase the appropriations for temporary restrooms to serve historic Corolla Park and the lighthouse during the construction of the boat museum, maritime museum, which will include public restrooms. We're required under contract to provide restrooms on the lighthouse grounds or in the facility. Um, this would essentially take money that is recognized from occupancy tax and allow us to spend it for that purpose. Thank you. Any questions? All right, I'll move to approve the budget amendment. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and uh, there's, uh, the final budget amendment for under TDA is to recognize some interest earnings that we had, and we'll use that to cover the um, some increased um, cost for credit card processing fees, insurance and bonds, and software licensing fees above and beyond what we budgeted for. Thank you. Move to approve. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Nothing Thank further you to all. say. Um, we have a motion to adjourn the special meeting of the Tourism Development Authority. So moved. Thank you. Second, Second Ms. Kitty. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all. Be safe. We'll see you again in a couple weeks.